Welcome to Ambient Discourses, conversations with musicians and composers who create musical experiences and sonic landscapes. My guest on the program is Brian Ficino, a prolific guitarist, ambient artist, producer, and mixer from the Nashville area. He has numerous releases and collaborations on the Hard Dance label, has an extensive history in the music business, and as I've found over the course of our conversation, both wisdom and maturity that we all could learn and benefit from. Normally in the program, I try to start us out light and get to know the artist a bit more, but we quite organically said, screw it, let's dive into the deep end and right out of the gate. And with no regrets. Our conversation steered through a variety of topics like stripping away the ego, branding for today's artists, the power of gratitude and empathy, and a whole lot more. Plus, we spent some time talking about his latest releases, Reflection Spaces, Volumes 1 and 2, some of the projects he's presently involved in, and his connection to Heart Dance Records. It was an absolute delight of a conversation for me, and it showed with our conversation spanning nearly two hours. This is one long form conversation you won't want to miss. So press pause, go grab a snack, and get comfortable. We're going in for a cruise in the deep end of the conversational pool with Brian Ficino. Oh, well, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm doing great. I am doing absolutely great. Totally vibing today. And I always look forward to these interviews because they're just um every single one of them have been unique and everyone's always just had really interesting things to say or interesting perspectives and and quite frequently you know we start dipping into the deeper philosophical questions behind music and creative creativity and all that and so it's it's good time i'm in for that if that's where we're going yeah yeah we'll go, we'll go wherever feels most naturally and on a practical level that's kind of how the interviews are structured they're very casual um very conversational i might use some questions to kind of prompt us now and then but for the most part uh this is just a really organic conversation between two musicians and and kind of really start uh talking about maybe some of the the deeper topics about music that don't get talked about very frequently and i think would be really interesting to other people well i dived a little bit into um um what you're doing man you got a ton of stuff out there man i love uh not only sonically what you're doing but like visually like when i went to your page and it just showed everything it's like you got a you got a cool like vibe to your theme like i feel like your music really matches like the real spatial photographs that you have going on and i was i, I just i thought like i hate to use the word package and and brand or whatever but it but it is but you you seem very it seems very concise and that's something i i've never had like i am i'm all over the map and i'm fine with that but like when i saw it you just it looked tidy and cool and i'm like damn that's oh thank you really yeah um it's it's something that has evolved over the past four years um there's uh, and it's you know in the beginning it was a mess just like anyone else's stuff you know out there and i think it's just taken time to slowly refine the brand and and refine really what my motivations are right and the things that drive me to do what i want to do what i want to spend my time on and ironically um, I spend a lot less time making music now and really more, a lot, significantly more time getting to know other musicians, um, oh. really getting a deep dive on their works and promoting them, which, you know, it, it started out as kind of a, um, kind of like a selfless exercise to just, you know, change my focus a little bit. And I realized, um, just how awesome of an experience it can be for all persons involved. Um, yeah, like the, some of the conversations I've had, I walk away just like I'm cloud nine. Like I'm like, did that just happen? It's like, holy crap, that was so awesome. You know, and it happened. And for them too, on the other end, you know, some of them have 
some of my guests have just been like, man, I just really needed that time. And it solidified for them a lot of ideas and challenged them. And so it's, so it's this kind of, um, I don't know, this discipline of just trying to get to know people and, and it's turning out to be a thing of building community and nurturing one another and supporting one another. And it's just fantastic. I, I wouldn't do anything differently. <laughs> well, of course, this is your show, but I do have a question for you. Do you feel, because I, you know, I'm always talking to other musicians and, and post the lockdown and everything with COVID, um, when I was back out there playing and, and, you know, just being back out into the world, a lot of my friends were, were, were craving like the, the interactiveness of playing with other musicians because we, we all kind of like went into our own studios and we did all that. Did you find like your, you, you kind of took off on this journey for yourself post that? Did it have anything to do with that? I'm just curious. Actually, that's a really, really good question. And for me, um, I started, I started making instrumental music a long time ago. Um, I, started out with in a lot of different bands you know i've been in a number of different alternative bands and um a couple slightly avant-garde things and i found my experience in bands very difficult uh you know because you have competing egos and it's very difficult to get you know three four five musicians who are all on different planes of consciousness or egotism to work together as a cohesive unit and just decide we're going to leave all our egos at the at the door and just come to be a collective and i've i've really only had one kind of band experience like that all the other ones it was just ego uh so but the pandemic short right before the pandemic i had um discovered stoicism and that philosophy really transformed my perspective on music, why I make music, what my motives are. And, and I decided, you know, cause I was, I nearly hung up. I nearly sold all my guitars, all my gear. I was, I was nearly fed up with it because of my model, my model for how the music industry is supposedly supposed to work. And, <clears throat> And in the process of really, so to try and distill it down, I, I, I threw away my old model. And, you know, that's the, that's the model that we've all kind of adopted, this idea of, all right, got to really work on my songs, my craft, um, get a good demo, shop the demo, get a label to pick it up, you know, have them help pay for the album, go on the tour, all the things, and, you know, with the trajectory. Um, but this kind of did a level reset for me and that in that, um, it was trying to rediscover music creation in its more pure form without the distraction of capitalism. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I'm with you on that. And, yeah. yeah. And yeah. And so over the past four years, it's been this process of trying to strip away the ego, strip away um, the things that, I don't know, have been priorities for me, but now don't matter. Now it's really more about, am I connected to the universe and I'm re am I really tapping into the kind of hidden frequencies? And I don't mean that in kind of like a, Ooh, 432 hertz frequency is going to heal your second shot. No, not like that, but more of a, more of just a, this really tapping into some of the universal feelings that we all have and the universal experiences and what the energy is like within that. And then trying to distill that into art, into music, into even the visual, even the little finite details or fine details of the the redesign of my website or uh, the new look and feel of the Stolas Relay Station when when that drops. So it's it's become more of a purist 
thing and not and not in an egotistical ooh look at me look at the stuff I create because <laughs> I don't care it, it doesn't matter to me who hears my stuff anymore or who sees yeah. it and purely taking the ego out like yeah. I um, if I just just to talk on that for one second like yeah the you know I came up in in a, a band that was fairly successful around Warner Brothers we were touring all the time whatever. And then when that kind of went away, my I, I shifted gears. And since, since since I've been getting older, I'm realizing that really just life experiences is, is the only, it's the only thing for me. I'm just, I can only talk purely for me, yep. but like making sure, oh, is this going to be right for, the, will this crowd like this? or will like, like when you strip all that away and you really just purely, because you have zero control, yeah. And um, over what somebody's going to like, and if you can enjoy what you're doing, that really is that's the end all because you're the only that's 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 where that's the only place you can really be present mm. is is in the in the act of doing it and the act of creating it and if you believe in it and and you do not worry about all the little things like you said you know it, it I think it it's kind of getting the ego out of the way. Yes. You know, the ego's worrying about everything outside of you, but if you if you work from the inside and you just enjoy what you're doing when you're doing it. And also the other thing is money and in guitars and and success and all that can be either taken away or or whittled down or watered down or or faded away but the one thing nobody can take away from you is that kick-ass feeling you have when you're proud of something you've done or you connected with uh, just saying the frequencies that 420 hertz that that fuzz tone that echo that was just perfect all those things when when you get it right nobody can take that away from you and for me I'm all over the map because I don't care what lane I'm in as long as I'm enjoying the ride. Yeah. And, you know, because, and, and it's because I went through the whole, um, you know, when on Warner Brothers, you're like, yeah, we got to make sure it sounds like this. We're going to put you with this producer, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and all that's gone. And you, we were so like deep into that. And now it doesn't make a crack bit of difference. Mm-hmm. Right? So kind of, I guess, hopefully it tied into what you were saying where oh, it did. we're stripping that away. And, you know, like, I mean, I, I I love guitars. I love old guitars. I have a bunch of old, great vintage guitars. But I'm sure you've sold a guitar in your life or a piece of gear that, like, you still kind of, there's still that little, oh, I wish I still had it. Prior to, and I've done that a couple times. I've kept most everything. But the couple that I've let go that I was kind of, like, bummed out about the next day they were gone it had zero impact on my actual being (laughs) yeah right (laughs) and it's like it's like hard to almost like it's almost hard to like believe that when you when you're like oh i love that guitar it had so many memories or it sounded this way and then you wake up and you're brushing your teeth and you're like i'm brushing the teeth the same exact way and i don't have that guitar anymore yeah. But that that can be applied to so many different things in life. So for for me, I think being present in the moment and making the music you want to make for you, and being true to that is is king. It what- it sure is. And you're you're talking my language right there. The uh, <laughs> stripping out the ego and getting down to the basics of what it means to make art, and not and like you're saying to be very present to be conscious in what you're doing because i think if you get the minute you start dwelling on the results and how you want this to like how many do you have goals in mind in terms of how many views you want on youtube or streams on spotify and if i think the more that you spend time in that space the more it really distracts yeah Let's pause the conversation for just a moment. We're going to check out a track from Brian's latest album, Reflections Spaces Volume 2. This is a great track. One of my favorites, actually. And this is entitled Guided Paths, here on Ambient Discourses.
segueing into your your latest works which by the way were really good reflections spaces volumes one and two i listened to those um uh and ad nauseum i say this to almost every guest i take it with me on my <laughs> sacred walks with my dog i take her for nice long walks and and i give the music just a really deep focused present listen and like immerse myself and for me when i was listening to both volume one and two i i the only way i can describe it is that for me it was listening to the foundation of a diorama but it didn't have all the details and the details were the things that i brought to the table so it was like it was almost like different facets of the music you know maybe it was the particular progression or a line that the guitar made or um, the way certain sounds or chord combinations worked with one another and they would conjure little pictures of my my life my history and so it was just like I had this mental image of your music as the soundtrack and I'm just Oh yeah, well here's this picture of me from when I was 21 and I had bright auburn hair that I dyed myself and wearing my Birkenstocks and looking like a crazy dude, you know, mm-hmm. just and so all these little pictures of my different times in my life I could find spaces for in your compositions and it was just a really really cool listening experience for me. Oh, great. Thanks, man. And so t- let's let's talk about the project a little bit. What um, take me into? So you're you're starting to think about maybe you just wrapped up. I think maybe, was it of the light? I believe. Um, well, after of the light was um, was forward moves. It was okay. it was more of a jazzy kind of record. Okay. Um, it still came out on Heart Dance Records. Yeah. Um, I had. What happened was I came up with a ton of material and went out and I know you've interviewed Sherry Finzer. Mm -hmm. And so I went out, uh, I live in Nashville and I went out to um, Arizona and met with her and Cass Enawati who masters all my stuff. Uh, And I played them all these different, um, they were, most of them were fairly close to being wrapped up but not mixed and i just wanted to get get her take on it and get his take on it and there was a collection of them that clearly by listening to everything felt a little bit different genre yeah and so they had suggested hey you know what if you took this out and you know thought of it like this so forward moves is was started to be on the uh, reflection spaces, but it was like a, a thing of five songs that I just tweaked for a different genre. And she put it out and we were we were just seeing what it would do. So it's it's more jazzy. It's more I, I, I don't want to say it's not smooth jazz because it's got a bunch of no. ambient qualities to it. But yeah. um, so after of the light, that's what happened. And then when that I, I was I had worked my butt off at the end of the previous year and so i took three months and i did that record and i did both um volume one and two of reflection spaces all at the same time i just hunkered down in my studio and for about three months just woke up every day and worked yeah so that um it was it so the reflection spaces one and two were a they were a product of literally that's what it was like i was coming up with things that allowed me to reflect yeah. like um i was going through a lot of changes uh you know giving up drinking and and smoking and and all this other stuff and trying to get healthy and so i was using these songs as a platform for me to help heal mm-hmm. from um, other things in my life as well and so um I, I continued to build them so they felt good to me. And that's all I cared about. Like, can, is, is this, is, is the act of doing this helping me? And, and at the end of it, if I felt like I was happy with it, then it was done. 
that's as simple as that. I, I really enjoyed, I really worked hard on uh, the sonics of both records. Um, I used a lot of uh, like old school four track cassette tape things manipulation i have a bunch of tape that goes um there's a lot of things that sound like synth that are all just guitar oh i knew oh. it <laughs> yeah so there's a lot of things that <laughs> make me sound like an analog synth that are like treated guitars well so reflection spaces basically is a is a group of songs that i used to help myself reflect like i i used them uh as a as a healing journey, like the act, act of doing these songs for me was very healing. Yeah. And, um, and I really wanted to do something that I just felt was, uh, kind of organic and true to how I was feeling. And, um, I was, you know, I, I used some keyboards, but a lot of, a lot of what you hear is just manipulation of guitar. Yeah. Yeah, that that really took me by surprise when you mentioned that because there were a lot of really cool synthetic parts in there that, you know, I had kind of an inkling that I wasn't sure how much of that was guitar, but I had a feeling about it. <laughs> I have to say, the, the so the way the, your approach, I think... Uh, made it really interesting for me because this was um, not unlike other albums that I've been listening to from other ar artists in, in even uh, neighboring genres where it's been kind of this dioramic f um, approach to making an album like they each have their own little tiny story within a story um, metaphorically speaking of course but and that's the way I felt like your album was for me, like it, it allowed me sufficient space and it was imaginative enough. There was like it. So it wasn't like just the same type of sound from song to song. There was, there was a kind of a net, what felt like to me a natural progression from, but with unique soundscapes in each song, you know cool. what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I wanted to make sure everything had its own uh, space, uh, to coin a term. Um, I wanted to make sure that it, it brought the listener on a journey if they listened all the way through. And it wasn't like, if you listened to the album more than once, you, weren't, you wouldn't be confused if everything just started off the same. And it was just a different color of the same, which is, which is great, which is fine, but... I again I, I have no issue like kind of jumbling up genres together to to make my idea come out. Right. I think not being afraid of of branching out into that space, I think you end up with more interesting compositions, I think. Because there's a little bit you you can't ever be lulled into an expectation of that that you're gonna get the same <laughs> the same stuff throughout the album it was really right. unique in fact the even even the listening to some of your guitar voicings in some of the different songs they even had kind of different essences or flavors about them like one moment i feel like i'm i'm listening and, and there's hints of david gilmore coming out and and another moment it feels like oh man this could totally be a mark knopfler tune or you know and that's kind of what it was for me so i i it almost felt like i had little hints into people that were even and i'm just presuming this but presuming that you you know some of these influences kind of um have become a part of your musical dna yeah and i can't I, I it's i don't even try to hide it like it's it's for me because i spent i mean i started playing when I was eight and i i've probably said more on guitar than i've spoken in my entire life it's going to come out in in my my verbiage it's going to come out in my language and and you hit two of the big ones like i'm a huge gilmore fan huge Knopfler fan love jeff beck i love adrian Ballou, i love robert fripp um you know anybody that kind of took took some chances i, I always thought was cool and not that like i 
I mean, I can't say that when I was in my 20s, I wasn't still trying to be them because I was in that young gunslinger kind of mindset. But now it's just because I've kind of facilitated the ability to um, kind of recall those influences. If I feel it's the right sound, I do it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you know, and so at any given minute in one song, I can switch, you know, I, I can switch my, my tonal space um, into hopefully at some point it sounds like me, like I can hit the note and you're like, okay, no, that's definitely you. That's what everybody's trying for. But mm -hmm. Can't lie and say it's not made up of the people you just said. Oh, totally. It's yeah. It's it's part of who we are. Like it's unavoidable. In fact, I th think the way that to really liken it to something that isn't copyright infringement or trying to overly steal or overly uh, identify with another artist's work or their sound, it, but from a cultural standpoint like historically songs were passed down uh from family right. to family and there's a certain timbre or rhythm to way things were sung or done or maybe there's a certain way that an instrument was played in a given culture so to come out you know into you know beyond your formative years as an instrumentalist and you're you bringing with you sounds from other instrumentalists other artists that's a part of you now because that was a part of your formative years when you're growing up listening to floyd albums like on vinyl or you're you know you're you're and it's just a it's just a part of you it's well I there's times when I'm laughing and I sound just like my dad. Yeah. So if I'm a guitar player and I'm listening to certain guitar players all my life, I mean, yeah. it makes sense. Like we're just we we are products of that. Like, and and nobody's nobody's like going. I can't believe you're ripping your dad's laugh off. Like, <laughs> like I can't help it. It's just kind of why. So you know, like yeah, when you're when you're ten years old and you're listening to like, you know, Jeff Beck and he's playing and you found out what a whammy bar is and you've been doing it for that long, you're it kind of yeah. turns into you and you that's you know, I I'm not trying to make Jeff Beck covers or anybody any other guitar player cover music. I'm just trying to be me, but yeah. but just like we are we are humans and and we we take that that those influences with us if we're lucky you know yeah 100 percent. i mean that's it's it's only natural and it's sometimes why i feel like the law does not belong in the realm of art because <laughs> almost all art is going to involve some level of copy and paste you know oh yeah it's 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 just inevitable because you're you're creating something in response to what someone else has done. I mean, that's kind of what art really is. You you observe something, you hear something, you touch something, feel something, and you respond in kind with a medium that makes most sense to you, whether you're a musician or a writer or uh, a playwright or a construction worker, woodworker, doesn't matter. I mean... You learn right. from the people before you and you have to emulate them. So it only makes sense that in the great root system of music throughout all of history and all of time, of course, we're going to have thousands of guitarists out there that have deep influences to David Gilmore or to Jeff Beck or whoever. It's because it's a part of our culture. <laughs> yeah, you know, and really, like if if you if you grow up digging something, um, even even like uh, I mean, even even real trailblazers that like that came up and and really took some left turns. But if you if you grew up with something, right, and it's it it satisfies you to hear it or to play it, then your your most um, your 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 most true work to yourself is doing things that you do that 
make you feel that it's right. Mm -hmm. And so you were going to draw from the things that make you feel right. Um, and how they come out is a, is a complete product of yourself. How far you bring those influences with you is, is a completely different thing. But I think, I think it, it should be acknowledged that like, if you're really being true to yourself and you're drawing from things that you really dig, then you're going to, your influences are going to have a little bit of influence on it. Yep. Yep. So I wanted to ask you because you mentioned something and it's a conversation I've been um, having uh, recently with mm -hmm. some uh, buddies of mine. Um, when you had said it, you know, it's these influences make up who we are. And the question that when I, my whole life, like when, when the, the topic came up of is music something you do or who you are? My first, mm. my first thing has always been, it is who I am until about three years ago when I woke up and said, wait, if music is who I am, uh, what can I bring to it? I'm not bringing anything to it because it's just there. <laughs> so I realized that, right? So, so I realized like, no, music is literally just what I do. And I freed myself. It yeah. was less, it became less important and therefore more fun. And I realized that if, if I separated myself from feeling like it was who I am, then I could bring myself to it. Mm -hmm. And also if it went away, I still existed. Yep. I know this is real but, but no it's but, not it's that's I, right I, on I, you get it like you know and and so being in touch with both sides of that for me has really especially in the ambient world and the way that i'm trying to present the music that i'm creating there it's been a huge lift for me mm -hmm. you know yeah. i mean it's so easy to go this is who i am and like you know put your feet in the sand and then once you kind of free it and it's like oh no it's just something i do wow that's way more freeing <laughs> i might even i might even challenge that idea that music is even more than just something you do but when that vibration has been captured when those frequencies have been captured into some form that is transmissible <laughs> it becomes its own living entity because uh, I, I, the, man I'll, I'll spend money on that one the, for sure the frequencies are still alive they're just held in stasis until your app until your phone or your your turntable can reinvigorate those frequencies and then this is where I get a little bit on the deep end. <laughs> Some of these ideas are pretty challenging to the conventional uh, thoughts of the way the world works. But I really I'm really warming up to this idea that we are really deeply, deeply interconnected, not just as human beings, but also all of the, the the nature around us trees even the void the space in between everything that everything is connected and there's bits and pieces that is coming out of scientific findings that are starting to kind of hint that yeah maybe this is so like the whole finding of the quark particles and how they change their behavior when they are observed yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird. This is weird stuff. And but so so I feel like we are so way much more than we are even able or capable of seeing and understanding and comprehending. When I'm listening to a track from like res reflective spaces or something that, um, you know, like one of Sherry Finzer's pieces or whatever, um, I feel I it's easy for me to feel a connection with these pieces, with these compositions and albums and works of other artists because it feels like this living entity you can have a conversation with the conversation isn't with words obviously it's more of a 
what kind of universe can we create together in my imagination? I love that, man. And t- so to me, in that way, music is alive. It's its own entity. So for me, as an artist, to try and possess my own music or to call it my music, I'm slowly stripping that out of my vocabulary because it's it's like, like when I talk about... Um, the Atmos, uh, the latest album that I created. It's I'm really trying to distance myself from it because it's its own. It's just a snapshot in time of vibrations and sounds and frequencies that I really connected with and and lifted me into um like a shamanic space mentally you know and i'm like yeah i i'm really happy with this and but it and it just has its own life it yeah and it interacts with people in the way it's going to interact with and yeah maybe it doesn't have consciousness of course but but it has that electrical current within it that consciousness though yeah so, yeah, that's my long, <laughs> my long-winded answer to to your question. That I, 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 yeah, I see, I really see music as being just it's an entity of itself that we have the pleasure of ushering into this world, and without our participation, okay. it would never come around. It'd never come to be. I've got another track here I want you to hear, and this comes from Brian's album Reflection Spaces Volume One. This is entitled Sidra, here on Ambient Discourses.
Yeah, I like the way you just said that we usher we usher it in. Because it, you know, it's just it's there. Yeah. You know. Like I think about I don't know if you've ever had moments like this, but like I remember when I was um I was eighth grade, I think. It was eighth or eighth or ninth grade. And I remember having this really vivid idea for a song in my head. And months later, maybe it was even weeks later, I don't, I'm a little fuzzy on the details because it was a long time ago, I heard a Bon Jovi tune on the, a brand new Bon Jovi tune on the radio. And I'm like, oh, that sounds just like the idea that was in my head. Like it was... It was that song, like, I would die for you, these five things I say, you know, it's like, I had very similar ideas just floating in my head for a song. I'm like, I'm like, how'd they do that? (laughs) They they robbed me. Have you ever had those moments where you're thinking about somebody and they call within like the next minute? Yes. Okay. So maybe it's one of those moments. Maybe like, I, and that's where I feel like, damn, man, we are connected. And it's oddly enough for me, it's been happening like at an accelerated rate where yeah. I'm thinking of somebody and they call or, you know, or, or what, whatever, or I end up seeing them. And so, you know, if you say we usher things in, like, I like that idea that we usher these things in. Maybe, maybe you were just feeling it being out yeah. there. Yeah, I like that idea. I, that's a, that's a very interesting idea because that would be in line with um, some of the quark particle ideas that like how to or no in quantum entanglement. That's the word I was looking for. Like how two electrons that could be like millions of light years apart, but they respond identically, you know, to the same stimulus in the same way instantaneously. So the idea being able to communicate through an infinite span of distance so maybe to your point that maybe there is something about this this kind of being quantum entangled with other people's musical ideas that they're interacting with themselves well that's yeah it's very possible i and to that like that whole idea that if you like you you split this in half and then like there's infinite space between two points yeah (laughs) That that drives me nuts. But at the same time, it's like, well, if that's possible, anything's why not? Can I can I bring up a couple of cool things that I'm involved with that I'm I'm getting ready to work on? Absolutely, please. I would love to hear it. I uh, I would, and I know you can edit this, but I would like to just talk about Sherry and Heart Dance and just give a shout out because yes. they. Yeah. So, you know, I. I met Sherry uh, and Cass Anwadi um, about four or five years back, uh, and they were doing Majestica, and they asked me to come join them on a um, on a live show on Echoes with John, and then um, we uh, we worked on some music together. We did a record together, and me and Cass have stayed friends, and he does all my mastering. And, and at that time, Sherry said, "I have a label," and. Um, I, I've always done ambient music. I was listening to Brian Eno back when I was a kid, but I've been, I've made most of my living in, in the kind of like a rock world. So I wanted to start doing it again. So when she gave me the forum to do it, um, I was really, really happy. And she's been amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't thank her enough for opportunities she's she's gotten for me and my music oddly enough i remember being on a plane when i was with my band uh and going man i wish i could get some of my instrumental music on on an airplane one day it was like a a pipe dream back then right yeah and now jerry's got me on like jet blue and united and a bunch of other things so i'm i'm super grateful for it anyways but i just But but yeah, so I I only started doing actual ambient records when I got onto Heart Dance. I have a bunch of like rock instrumental records that uh, that were prior to that. But um, but the reason we're talking is because of because of Sherry and Heart Dance. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but I want to tell you about a couple of cool things that I do. So outside of the ambient world, I produce records for other artists, and um, 
I pl generally play guitar and bass and mix and produce them for these people if, if it's not a full band. And and one of the cool things uh, I've been involved with has been working with charities for children and making records for uh, for charities. And so what we'll do is we will take like five or six people and we'll go somewhere like a beach house or a or a house on a lake or somewhere and we get together for a week and we match everybody up and they they go and they write and then i have a recording room in the house or wherever and then in a week we write and record a record i finish mixing it and then all the proceeds go to charity oh cool and one of them one of the charities uh is called rock by the sea and it helps uh kids with pediatric brain cancer like we we any kind of um they they also do like festivals so between the records and the festivals they they raise money and they give they've given thousands thousands of dollars away um and then the other one i have been doing recently is a charity out of denver called earth angel and we are i'm literally leaving on saturday for 10 days to go to a beach house on the beach in mexico with seven artists to go write and record a record uh -huh. and all the things go to children's hospital denver that's really awesome. Yeah, it is. It's a it's an amazing, amazing uh, position to be in. And um, one thing I'm going to do on this, I think I'm going to make this entire record completely acoustic. Normally, I'd bring an electric guitar, and we yeah, and most most guys play or or the girls play acoustic. Um, but we have a violin player, we have a keyboard player, the rest of it, everybody's playing uh, acoustic guitar. I'm bringing like a ukulele, a little um, ukulele bass, and a nylon string. And so we're going to do, a, hopefully, a completely acoustic record. Ah, cool. So, yeah, I've, I've been really fortunate to be involved with a bunch of different things other than the ambient thing as well. But I'm, I'm very, very proud of the ambient world that i've i've kind of entered into and and i really appreciate you having me on the show you are busy you've got a lot of I, things I'm in the hopper busy. and i really like that idea of coming together with a few different artists and you know coming up with an album and you know for for charity like that that's really um especially ones that's there's more focused charities or something that's pretty hyper local because there's something about when you're giving to something that directly affects a surrounding community you can you can see your that impact a lot more readily than yeah here's my <laughs> check off to some organization i'm never going to interact with or you know you never know where the money is going to go man like the yeah. it's it it's totally i totally agree the um it's i mean it and i've said this before when it comes to these these organizations they're so good to the musicians and they're both so good to the the organizations that they give to mm -hmm. And it's easy to like just to write a check, but I think what both organizations are doing, they're they're building community around different charities, like they're bringing people together and putting on a rock show or making a rock record. Um, but they're but the, every person they bring to those shows or that they sell the record to, are being more aware of the charities themselves. So not only are they getting the experience of the music. They're also getting they're getting enlightened to hey we're going to be giving all proceeds to this charity or this hospital. I love it, man. It's it's mm. it's a really beautiful thing to be a part of. Mm. That is, man. I I'm a sucker for things that are you know going back to helping the community out. That's that is flipping that's flipping fantastic right there. So looking ahead to um music projects so you've got you would, so you do you have any projects coming up in the hopper things that you're going to be uh, working on beyond uh, volume one and two here for the rest of the year um well volume two is going to just going to volume one and volume two will hopefully carry me into like early early next year okay and i'll probably be getting something ready for next spring um, I released three this year. Oh yeah, that's that's a pretty aggressive so, schedule. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna let them go. I've got I'm booked through the rest of the year, either producing other artists or making this record for charity. Um, and then next year I I'm, I'm gonna see. Um, hopefully, 
I, I like doing the EP format, man. I, I really like it because it's I can concentrate on four or five. It's not too much. And if somebody digs it, they'll be waiting for hopefully wanting to hear the rest of it rather than right. just being stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's actually yeah, you're right. It is a really good compact format and plus it allows you it's a little bit easier, I think, to craft a space within four or five songs and and then the next EP project you might change it up, you know, change up the the sonic space. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, I like that. So, um yeah, I got I mean, I, I've always had a lot of different irons in the fire like Working with hard dance is the most like singular line that I've taken like for any aspect in a long time. Like just and I this t- happened a long time ago, but it's a funny story. Like I played on a Guar record. Mm. I don't know if you know who Guar is. Well, they um, Guar is a heavy metal band. They kind of dress up in costumes and they're like, it's pretty cool. But they they tour all around the world, and they their fans are rabid. And years ago, after playing on that record, um, I was playing in a country cover band in like South Dakota. And I walked through the kitchen and they were playing the record that I played on. And I literally had like a red and white checkered country <laughs> shirt on, man. And, and, and the cooks are tattooed all the way head to toe, long hair. And they're and I'm like, oh, I played on that song, and they're like, bull. So I had to take my my um my driver's license out and show them. They had the CD right there, and I'm and they're like, what the f are you doing in South Dakota in a country <laughs> bar, man? And I felt like I won because I'm like, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're fun. <laughs> so I try to I try to mix it up quite a bit. I think it keeps it interesting, you know, if you're not beholden to one particular style or genre you know it's i think it makes for a lot more fun and freedom it's it's imp- i think when people say stay in your lane it's impossible like if i got a manager they'd be like uh <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> yeah. yeah and i mean i can see on a practical level at least for the traditional model of doing music yeah there's something to be said for kind of at least staying within the same genre but sometimes that can be pretty difficult in fact we, well that's what i'm saying like working with heart dance at least i i keep that as as linear as possible because i really like where it's going i like yeah. working with sherry and um you know but like all the other stuff is just it's just kind of fun to do mm-hmm. different things we were in fact i was talking about that with my my last guest on the the relay station we were talking about or excuse me on ambient ambi- discourses and he was talking we were talking about the unique thing that musicians and creators and artists have this new reality of branding is a thing that we have to focus on now and apply some level of attention to and how do you feel about that? How do you feel about, I mean, we kind of alluded to that at the very start of our conversation when we were kind of talking about brand and all that. How do you, how do you feel about the idea of artists having to manage their own brand? I think, well, I personally think I, it, it's a good thing if, and if you manage your brand to a point where it becomes unmanageable and big enough and you get somebody that aligns with your vision, I think it's amazing because you do have the ability to carve out how you want to be perceived and nobody's telling you. Um, the bad part about it is that most of us musicians and artists are so wackadoo and no, it's, it's hard. I, most, most of the people I know hate trying to figure out what they are. And what their music sounds like and all that so sometimes it's easier to have somebody go this is what we're doing so it's 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 it, it's very much um it's got good points and bad points i i do think uh, do you know who laura anderson is yes Remember? she was she was one of those artists that no matter what she did you knew it was laura anderson but you weren't sure what she was gonna do yeah she focused on she was her brand her the art did not dictate her brand mm-hmm. and i always loved individuals and artists that 
their brand was them and their art was a product of them not they were a product of what art they created yeah and and so that's why i've never really shied away from doing something that was completely polar opposite because i'm like if somebody digs me and what i do and they don't like that aspect maybe they'll dig that it doesn't matter mm -hmm. like i just think it's when people if people have the ability to manage their own brand and they 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 do it in a way that's kind of true to themselves that's it's not going to like um if their music changes their brand's going to disappear then i think that that's a good thing i don't know if i i don't know if i said that right but it's like if you change it like if, if you decide one day you wake up and you want to take a left turn on your music if that is going to destroy the brand then you're not really branding you as an artist you're branding your music yeah yep 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 you're letting your music dictate um who you are who you present yourself to be and now you're beholden to that now you are the slave yeah i mean and and um, you know imagine how cool aerosmith still looks or how the stones still look cool but there's a lot of bands that are older that do not look like they sounded 30 years ago yeah. and when you see them you're like oh maybe you shouldn't be out there yeah 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 i yeah one one particular band band's front man comes to mind <laughs> i don't I probably, I probably don't even need to bring up because he's on the socials all the time and i'm like yeah dude know. please yeah. hang it up hang it up please <laughs> we loved you when you were 20 something and struggling with alcohol and drugs and now <laughs> you now you look like a sad older caricature of yourself your younger self which it, it, it with which i have to also be a good human being and acknowledge that my observation about that is really shallow because when, I, when i when i was talking about there are some older bands that that for me it's there, there's definitely the visual thing like I, you know if it, a little bit but for me it's more like when you can't perform you know yeah that music anymore it, when when you just can't physically do it or if you don't decidedly make it different to kind of match where you were at then the music is dictating your image yeah like i think i i mean i think rod stewart's amazing and then like he can still belt the rockers out but he doesn't do them the same way yeah like and that kind of like that kind of chill album when he, it's so as a vocalist, as a as a as a artist, as a entity, he was true to himself, and yes. what was coming out of him was appropriate. Now I hate the word appropriate because art and rock and roll shouldn't really always be appropriate. So I right. I, I don't like that. Um, but in in alignment, maybe is what I should say. Well, if you're looking at it from a, a commodity standpoint, you're looking to entertain people, uh, particularly maybe in a. Maybe kind of like a. I, I don't want to relinquish Rod Stewart off to the casino, the casino, you know, tour circuit. But, but you know, there's there's a certain audience, and you know, there's there's kind of um, form. I don't want to call it formalities, but there's there's kind of expected things, you know. So Rod Stewart kind of going down a more relaxed approach to his music is totally appropriate, and I think is within that genre because it, you're playing to people's models of what kind of music they listen to now and so they're trying to mash these two worlds of i'm i've changed my music tastes have changed i've really settled down but i also really love this music that came out from you know rod stewart in the 70s or whatever and so it's kind of this amalgamation of two worlds of your current musical sensibilities to your tastes of your youth and kind of mashing the two together yeah. all right i've got another track i want you to hear and this comes from brian's jazz ep forward moves this is a recent release and it's got this great end of summer vibe to it the track we're going to check out features daniel clark on piano and organ and it's just a banger of a tune this is entitled that's right here on ambient discourses.
I do think I, I, too, and one one other thing about the whole branding thing. I do think that it used to be like if a record label believed in you, they would develop you, and 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 now there's no artist development. Every, uh, artist development's been privatized. There are companies galore out there that are trying to do artist development, um, be it uh, getting them recorded, teaching them how stage presence, all this stuff. The label doesn't do any of that anymore. They're literally just looking at numbers. And I think, man, I think it's very difficult in this crazy streaming. Everybody's putting up something like every five minutes on socials. I think it's crazy difficult. And so they're they're that's tough you know there there i don't know that they'll ever be a i don't know if, if it's set up with they'll, they'll ever be another rolling stones beatles led zeppelin mega band like that i just don't right. know let's unpack that for a bit because this has become this has come up a couple times and i've you know of course never been able to resolve to you know uh uh a, a consensus on this but let's let's unpack this idea of of that we've got such high saturation of artists and music and there's no shortage of music to listen to where do you think that leaves us then as creators to respond in a healthy way to the the vast drowning levels of music that's available for us how do you think we should respond as artists in that i think what i'm gonna say may sound a little um messed up but i don't think we should give a crap i think we should make our music i think we should enjoy it i think it should be part of our life experience there is absolutely no way that we have control over who's gonna listen to it without a bunch of money behind us that yeah. it's making something happen so when it comes to that i i think it's wasted energy to be bummed out about it mm -hmm. I, I i think if you want to do something about it you figure out a way to do something about it best you can otherwise you enjoy being a musician and be grateful that you get to do it and I, the difference is I'm older now. Like I'm not in my twenties, so I, I don't have the same, um, mm -hmm. same. I can't answer like the the way I would answer when I was younger. But right now, I'm I choose to do my best to let that go away mm -hmm. and make my music, and so so I can feel good about it. Yeah. Yep. When I was talking with Robert Rich, he had an interesting idea that we kind of played around with a little bit uh, music you know in its before it really became a commodity for us and and a product of capitalism <laughs> it was very community oriented um you know it fulfilled some sort of shamanic role within the community or to teach history or to fill some sort of social need and it was all about the immediate community you were surrounded by so if you you know you were a drummer or instrumentalist of some sorts you were serving a community uh, uh, and maybe that <clears throat> maybe as musicians yeah yeah we say screw screw the metrics why why does it matter and drawing our attention more to you know the immediate people that i'm surrounded by that have shared interest in these musical genres or ideas or expressions that maybe they become our immediate community where it's really, really where that's more heavily weighted than how many Spotify streams we have in the end. Yeah, I like that. Like I when when I um, I think when I when I was saying can't can't worry about it. It's it, you can't obsess that there's a billion songs being released. You can't because it's too much. It's yeah. it's above 
it, it's it's above like the threshold of of your control. So y- you just do what's in your control, and and I think still back down to enjoying the process of making the music is important, and do it. I think again, you know, at the stage of life where I'm at, I I, I mean, I'm lucky because I am on a label, and they do work hard to try to place my stuff and and i'm trying to get it out there as well but the the idea of how vast it is and how much competition and how much is going on yeah i can't i can't like i can't concern myself with it yeah it's too much and it's i think of the same thing for me like i don't think burying your head in the sand is a good idea when it comes to world news but who knows what is actual news anymore like (laughs) the like i i don't i don't actively watch like news programs anymore i quit i'm much happier for it um it's because it, it, you, you end up taking on so much uh, negative energy. Again, you don't know what's true and what's not, but but that that's not immediately f- affecting you unless you allow it to. Yep, I did the same thing. I think I stopped watching the news sometime after 2016 because I just I, I saw myself on a one way path to a heart attack <laughs> it's just it's anger town. stress oh my god i was angry all the right. time exactly and that's like i showed up at work one day it was in fact it was in november of 2019 and i showed up and i was so angry because there were some just really jack hole drivers that morning out in the commute in and I remember feeling absolutely out of control, like my life is spiraling and I can't get my anger under control and it's going to get the best of me one day. And so I hopped onto YouTube and I'm like, I need some sort of thing to help me get my anger under control because I feel out of control. And like for somehow all of the right keywords must have aligned and the algorithm said, my son, you need stoicism. <laughs> wow. And and it was like the very first video was this overview on the philosophy of stoicism. And it hit all of the points that we were talking about, but the opposite end of things like learning to let go of the things you feel like you have no control of over and focusing on just the real the the very small list of things that are in your control and that's usually some sort of variation of your outward expression your willful expression it could be things you say do your opinions your thoughts your actions if it's an expression from you and it's willful, you can do something about that. <laughs> that's a that that's a huge life thing, man. Like, and it, it, across the board, whether how how you react to things and yeah. and is is everything. Yeah. You know, like I heard this amazing. I and I'm sorry. I, I, it's probably a pretty popular little video blob on Instagram, but this guy was talking about how. Um, you know artists and musicians are people are creative types right Uh, across the board like we're always creating and when we stop creating like it people like like us like make shit up in your head so so you're like you get you ever get off the phone to somebody and they didn't respond the way you thought they should have and then you but in 10 minutes later you think oh my god this person hates me like they're never going to talk to me again i what did i say wrong and really what happened was like their dog took a poop on the floor in front of them and they were trying to pick it up and not let you know and it's (laughs) it's like so we're always creating stuff in our head and letting so i know this sounds like i went off on a tangent but letting letting the little things that you can't control go and trying to calm those stories in your head and just deal with what you can deal with yeah. is a real great recipe for happiness. Yes. Because yeah. because you take so much you take so much like what ifs out of your life and you're just boom. Yeah. 
just there. You're more present because you can't, you're always thinking about what happened or what is going to happen. When you stop and you're just right there, mm-hmm. I'm okay. I had a roof over my head. I'm dry. I'm warm. I got food in the fridge. Is everyone like, listening? Is everyone paying attention? <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, it's really hard to do. Yeah. But I also, I also think in the creative process, it's also very important to be like that. Yeah. Don't worry about there's a million streams that are going to come out on the same day. Don't worry what somebody might think of it. Make sure when you hit that guitar sound, you feel electric. And it's because you know it's right. That's all you have control over. And if you don't play guitar, then you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yep you're you're speaking my language brian this is this is this is the sort of thing that keeps me doing this week after week is is the hoping that these i these sorts of ideas that you and i are talking about right now that they that they hit someone who goes Oh my God, why didn't I think of that? I've been doing this the wrong, not the wrong way, but I've been doing this the less healthy for my mental well-being way, you know, and, and focusing and, or being distracted by all, all of the things that don't really matter. In fact, there's a lot too. There's a lot that doesn't. God, the the so the Stoics have this thing, and they call it the the dichotomy of control. It's it's just a simple tool to all right, make two columns, list out the thing within something you're you're struggling with. You list out all the things that are in your control, and list out the things that are not in your control. If it's not in your control, you're not allowed to futz with it. You you can't be bothered to worry about it you can't change anything you might be able to affect a little bit of change but you're so many of the stuff is it it comes down to you have to work on you as a human being you have to work on your opinions your opinions by the way (laughs) of course matter nothing the world continues to to turn (laughs) regardless of our opinions Um, and even our beliefs the things that we cling to our attachments the things that we're we're really hung up on our aversions the the things that repel us and the things that piss us off or all of that doesn't matter it's all it all can be changed because i mean this is we have like in America, it's it's the perfect illustration of when um, understanding and empathy doesn't go far enough. <laughs> We're first illustrating that it is possible within one idea to have widely different perspectives on something. So if it's possible then for multiple people to have different perspectives points to that there is probably on some level a a relative truth or a relative reality especially when it's factored into one's upbringing their history the the schools they went to the friends they hung out with the parents that they had or didn't have and that maybe it's not so much the perspectives and opinions that matter but really about what can I do to solidify and strengthen my connection with other human beings to treat them with love, respect, dignity, kindness, and maybe if I'm lucky, it'll be reciprocated. (laughs) Gratitude and empathy are two of the most um, important uh, things for happiness. I mean, I know we've been talking, I talked a little bit about that earlier, even you just as well. But to be grateful, um, to to take stock in how lucky you are to for whatever it is, to be grateful for things. You can't, you can't be like grateful for something and mad at it at the same time. Yeah. Not, not at least one thing. Like, yeah, I, I think that's, that may be impossible, but also empathy. When you, when you take time to be, 
to kind of feel like an alignment with somebody else and understand that we are connected and 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 have, have space in yourself to understand or even if you don't understand be okay with somebody else mm -hmm. like those are two methods uh, of taking like anger out of your life because gratitude it's hard to be angry when you're grateful for things like when you're in a state of gratitude it's hard to be angry when you're empathetic with somebody and and you gen you genuinely feel a connection or can see yourself in them it's it's harder to be mad at them for whatever they yeah. may fall short of your expectations and and so those are two things that i work hard to to try to keep in in balance um and and it's it's very easy to, like to like if you look at somebody, I feel like this is my personal opinion, but I feel like if you look at somebody and you can see yourself in them, like if they've done something and you can realize, wow, I've done that as well. What did I need to to feel myself come out of that? What kind of support did I receive or what I what didn't I receive? If you can give that to the person, I'm going to bring this all the way back to the front of this conversation when you said that this you started when you started opening yourself up to to talking with people and hopefully sharing all this stuff and it just feels good for everybody that empathy that seeing yourself in other people that connecting with other people keeps you in in a, in a positive state because so much of our anger comes from expectations of others that we never told them about mm -hmm. yep just Sorry, I know. Let that, a no, bit. no, that's. I'm just gonna let that one marinate just for a little bit longer. It's, it's especially in bands, man. Like I can't. I mean, and when you're younger, you 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 know, you were talking about all these egos coming together in a band, and 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 like you have to have a certain amount of ego to be on stage, and you want to like have a certain amount of bravado to like perform, so everybody's got a little bit of ego on. But then you're looking at the bass player and they don't they don't go to the other groove that you thought they were going to go to and they're in their own space. And then you're like, well, what the hell? Why didn't they go to that? Like, you never told the bass player you wanted him to go there. Why are you pissed <laughs> off? Like, it's just a myriad of things. And he starts stripping all that stuff away and it's a lot easier to be happy. Oh, so much more. Man, I tell you, that's it's a hard place to be in. You know, when you're in your teens into your 20s and maybe to some extent maybe well yeah you're into your 30s yeah. as a musician you're you're coming into it from all ego you're like hey look at me i've got something different to say and that's what we say in our hubris as we come up into our own unique spaces i've got something unique to say and it's it's really not you know we because the there's only so much of the human condition that's really, really unique to each individual. Dude, some of the best rock and roll came out of people having too big of egos. Like, there's a place for it, and thank God for it. Like, seriously, like, think about the ego David Bowie must have been, like, pushing when he was going all out. Or, or you know, Mick Jagger's ego getting on the front of the stage. Like, not I don't know exactly what their intentions were, but but they they some of the best stuff that we still respond to are people out there going, look at me. Because all, we all felt something from it, you know? But, but, but I don't know that it serves you well outside of being on stage and being in life as well. All right, I've got one more track for you, and this comes from the Heart Dance Records compilation, Deep Focus. This features a collaboration between both Kess and Awadi and Brian Ficino, and this is entitled Beyond the Peak, here on Ambient Discourses.
I love what you're doing, man. Like I like like listening to the music and then the fact that this podcast was i mean we we touched a little bit on music here and there but like just the fact that it, this was just like i love the two two cats just talking see where it goes i love that man it's it's i think hopefully people find it interesting but like i do well you know to be honest i really don't care if anyone else finds this interesting or not because Two years ago, actually, no, not even that, a year ago, the idea of me phoning up an absolute stranger and saying, we're going to sit down and we're going to have an hour and a half conversation wherever it goes, that would that would have terrified me. In fact, <laughs> yeah, if, if you really kind of hyper analyze, and please don't do this, please. <laughs> if you really were to go back and hyper analyze the interviews and listen to the questions and you would, you would pick up on, Oh my God, he is terrified. <laughs> but now it's with each and every conversation that I've had, I become more and more fascinated with, everyone's ideas and i'm starting to kind of get a broader picture of the universal truths you know the things that we all experience and hopefully in that and even by way of unpacking some of these deeply personal things we're experiencing or philosophies we're testing out and trying or um, avant-garde spiritual practices we're integrating into our life. They all have a way of affecting us as creators. And so it's those conversations that are really more and more and more interesting to me. And, and like, I remember <laughs> there was, I had posted a thing on TikTok and I was just saying, I was talking about how by changing my perspective about curiosity, like trying to approach the world with a lot more curiosity has really opened me up and challenged a lot of my long held ideas about the world and has made me this sponge just soaking in like from different mystic traditions. If something I see and hear resonates with me and works with me and also in the same breath, doesn't ridiculously uh, contradict the scientific community. <laughs> cool. That's a win for me. And so having these sorts of conversations in real time with, you know, people like yourself and, and I just, I hope that some of this kind of sticks with people and they start challenging some of their own ideas and, and they get to hear other people's stories. And that, that all kind of has a way of kind of mixing, you know, in with their own stuff. But yeah, all that to say that this is one of the joys in my life, it, being able to sit down and have conversations. And I, it wouldn't have happened without a little bit of curiosity and a little ball ballsy chutzpah of <laughs> let's make a podcast that no one's going to listen to or few people will. Actually, people are listening to it. It's <laughs> I was informed by someone that the podcast was like the 33rd podcast in music conversations in the UK. I'm like, oh, yay, a metric that I don't care about, but that's awesome. <laughs> Hey man, it, you know, if, if somebody's digging it and you're digging it, dig it. Yeah. I mean, it's what's really just most important to me is that people don't fall into a kind of complacency for how we do music and how we do art and to really explore different boundaries and, and, don't necessarily take everything um, as as gospel that comes out from the music industry and that we can forge our own path. We can create really unique stuff and we don't have to hold ourselves or restrict ourselves to any one particular genre or whatever. I think, I, you know, um, I do make a living from playing music and I have a lot of different irons and different fires and like um, sometimes I'm mixing, sometimes I'm playing, producing, whatever, all these different things. But when you think back 
let's just go back to like the community aspect of music. There was a time when people weren't, I mean, there was always street musician, whatever. And, and, and even as, you know, everybody's talking about these house concerts today. Well, in the 1920s, there were people going to rich people's houses and playing in their, in their foyer. So, but, so there's always been a little bit of a money aspect, but there was a time when music wasn't about commodity. It was about community. It was about storytelling. It was about connection. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the only thing that, that matters even now, though the landscape has changed the, in a hundred years, I don't think anybody's going to care that I played guitar. I don't even think anybody's going to care tomorrow, but that's just me personally. So, so like I, it, it comes down to like, if, if you're doing it and you're enjoying it and it's a life experience that you feel is the right one for you, like, I think that's where it starts. If you turn it into a commodity or somebody helps you make some money on it or you go toward, that's all bonus. But starting from you, if if you are proud of what you've done, that's that's like, man, that's the most important thing. And I think the easiest way, in my experience, to be proud of what you've done is to not let anybody else's opinions in. Because really the only time I think actual self-doubt comes in is when you worry about what else somebody's going to th- what somebody else is going to think mm-hmm. i work with artists all the time where i just think i've got a killer vocal on them and i know i got a killer vocal and they're like i don't know about the vocal i'm i'm afraid such and such isn't going to dig it like then you're not even concentrating on the vocal you're concentrating on them mm-hmm. and so i guess what i'm what i'm getting at is God, I know I'm talking in circles, but I guess what I'm getting at is like the the joy of making music would start hundreds and thousands of years ago coming out now. It's all the same thing. It's coming from a person. Mm-hmm. Same thing. The, the stuff that surrounds it nowadays is just different. Yeah. It's just different packaging. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I could have just said that, man. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's It's true, though. I mean, it's we we get hung up on all the things that don't really matter not that much oh. anyway and yep you're right and and just it's it is entirely liberating when you're just focused on the moment and you're not even you're not even getting into the meta aspect of what you're doing you're not you know you're just you find whatever flow state works best for you. You connect with, you know, some sort of ritual practice that helps get you into the frame of mind of observing and meditation and, and then responding, you know, maybe it's experimentation. Maybe you're the type of musician that, you know, your meditative practice is really just, Hutzing with knobs and dials and cables and trying different combinations until something just has a way of striking all of the right frequencies within you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you're not at all worried about, you know, how other people are thinking or going to respond. And it's, it's just like meditation because it's the same thing with meditation. Meditation, the minute, that you start um, thinking about meditation. <laughs> You're no longer meditating. <laughs> right, right, exactly. It's, yeah. it's this constant act of letting go. You observe, you let go. You observe, you let go. You observe, you let go. And, you know, for the more deeper meditation where you're actually working on personal stuff, like you're trying to change something about your behavior or your actions or whatever, then you meditate about that from all the different angles and then you let it go. And yeah. in the music creation, I think it's almost the same thing. You're just, you're let trying to tune yourself in to the universe you play and then you just let it go and you just ride the wave. 
I'll, uh, I'm going to bring one other thing up, and, and I don't want to go over time, but I, this, I found this very interesting. So I was talking with a, a, uh, a good friend of mine, um, and we were speaking about when you sit down and you're in the studio and you're, you're, you're futzing around, right? You're like searching for a sound, you're deep diving on samples, or you're going through pedals or whatever it is, you're deep diving, you're searching for something. And he was saying, you know, like, I get so caught up in the sounds and, and I, at the end of the day, I'm not sure if I like any of it. And so we started talking about the process of this. And there, so so I, I, I broke the I broke this into two different categories. One is you have an idea. You sit down to facilitate the idea that you have in your head. You may take a couple of forks in the road here and there, but essentially you're sitting down with an idea in your head and you're, and you're facilitating that idea. The other one is you are sitting down and you're futzing with sounds or you're futzing with parts to be inspired to create something. And the minute that you try to make those two work with each other, the minute that it's complete failure, because if you have nothing in your head and you're hoping to find inspiration somewhere, then you do not have an end product in mind clear enough to make that happen, mm -hmm. right? So you'll never ever finish a thing that you have in your head if you don't have it in your head. Right. It's just, it's math. If you don't have it, you won't, you won't get it. The other one is if, if you futz around too much, if you have an idea in your head and you're in the studio and you start doing too many knobs and you start going off on tangents, you'll never achieve what you have in your head. So one, if you don't come up with some a finished product and you've been messing with sounds all day, forgive yourself because you didn't have a finished thing in mind. If you have a finished thing in mind and you, and you go in the studio and you get some sounds and it comes out different, be okay with that too because you went after something yeah is, is that and so he was having the issue that he just wasn't finishing anything and i'm like well if you don't have something in mind to finish then then just enjoy the moment of creating and if it sparks something go from there yeah there's two different and i'm sure i i would i would bet money that you've come at your studio from two different things one you had an idea in your head and you went and you figured out all the sounds and you did it and the other one you sat down and you played something on a keyboard on a guitar and you went oh that's cool let's build something from that mm -hmm. yep two, two different methods and i don't if i think if, if if you if your expectations of either one are mixed with the other it doesn't work yeah i think you're right do you it's it's one thing to come at the table with an idea that's like crystallized in your head and you can see it or you can smell it or taste it yeah. and then you have to be sensitive to serve that idea and to nurture it whereas the other realm like you're talking about this idea of sound exploration that's that's the realm of what i would consider experimentation and science you're not really coming at it with an idea you're you're experimenting until something makes you go huh that's yeah. really interesting let's explore that idea and then you're then you're teasing an idea out of sounds and frequencies and resonance and yep yeah i i it's and it's i would argue it's very difficult to mix those two it's it because it's a different at least when i think about my experiences with it it's a different flow state yep it's a much different um headspace that you have to have yourself in like I, like when i think about um for me like the atmos album that was very flow state like i had i mean i gave myself creative limitations and i very specific parameters so i had this idea of like all right i want x number of different soundscapes that i want to be able to travel through and each one is going to have like a minute and a half leader and uh tail and they're gonna have chances, just moments to see how these things bleed together. And somehow every single one of them just kind of magically worked. Wow. Like these 
nine different pieces all written separately <laughs> they they worked and but i don't i don't know where i was going with that but but the 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 experimentation side of things is is that sensation is so much different than you feel this idea from the the universe like just drop in your head and you're like holy crap yeah let's figure that out and like i've got i've got a couple of those sorts of ideas that i've written down because and that's another thing if (laughs) if as a musician or an artist or a composer or writer, if you are not carrying around a small notepad with you at all times, you really should be because man, I've had, I've had some just crazy ideas at the most inconvenient times when I did not have a writing implement or something to jot down my idea. (laughs) And it's, I, I don't know. I think that's is just as important as your DAW and your instruments and stuff is, is really carrying around something to gather your ideas in a way that works for you. It doesn't have to be pencil or paper or anything. But I was at the gas pump the other day and it was going chikung, 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 chikung. Yeah. and I started making up a bass line in my head. So I pulled out my phone and I sang the bass line as I was filling up the gas. I haven't done anything with it yet, but when I got done with it, I was like, that's awesome. I feel like I just filled up and got an idea for free. Yes. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. So are you, are you mainly like, um, like, I mean, I know you multi multi instrumentalist, but what's your main thing? Are you mainly keyboards, mainly guitar? Um, it varies from month to month. I'm probably mostly keyboard, but I'm tightly coupled with guitar. Um, I don't play bass as much as I used to. When I was in a cover band, um, I was the bass player and lead singer. By the way, I have mad respect for people that sing lead vocals and play the bass because they're two distinctly different things going on at the same time, and it's absolutely brain-splitting. So Sting and um, Michelle Nidicello and all the other bass players out there that are also vocalists, <laughs> mad respect. But uh, you, uh, okay, go ahead. So, but yeah, those I think so. Basically, keyboards my my main stick. I I can probably play drums to save my life, but I would probably be be still be executed in the end for really bad fills. <laughs> I, I would kill myself playing the drums. I would somehow I would die playing the drums. Roll a nat one and impale yourself with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, uh, man, I Brian, I've really enjoyed this conversation, even hey, despite man. the the technical issues that I've been experiencing. That seems to be a resonant theme lately. Time to probably rebuild the system from the ground up which that'll be super inconvenient (laughs) but (laughs) my friend thank you so much for your time on this it just it's i just really uh, you feel like a kindred spirit to me and i really enjoy some of the ideas that you're exploring and and flip i really love your guitar tone (laughs) right on man thank you hey if you get a chance if you go on instagram um hit me up and i I do this thing called music the music four series it's music and then the number four okay and they're really goofy it's like the uh like it'll be like music for um i don't know what some of them are like music for for cats and then i'll just play some and they're only like a minute to 30 seconds but i keep having them come out um one the the one i just posted was Music for dancing with Krispy Kreme donut hats on. <laughs> it's like me playing and then two people dancing with Krispy Kreme donut hats. But if you get a chance, check it out. Um, I will. But before we go, I wanted to ask you, like, what's your guitar of choice? Like, what are you, what's your, what are you rocking? Um, my, I have two guitars that are my favorite guitars and both of them have endured far more abuse than I care to admit to publicly. Um, but my two favorite guitars of all time, um, that I own one is, was my first electric guitar. Um, 
I had purchased, um, I had saved up my money and I'd purchased this. It's a 1991 Yamaha Pacifica 921. Yeah, I remember those. And I loved the tone and the action. It was not a particularly expensive electric. Um, You know, probably, you know, might you know, would would basically it basically would not um, be like your total hero's choice of guitar because they would have this classic 1959 Strat, you know, or whatever, just something ridiculous. And but for me, the tone was so amazing, and it conjured up, you know, um, like the particularly the double humbucker just conjures up this feeling of like. Pink Floyd. It just brought a lot of that tone, like Gilmore's guitar tone, in there, and plus the versatility. It just had a lot of different phrasings and tones. My second favorite is my beat up acoustic. I've got this La Rive, which is oh, a French nice. French Canadian acoustic. I know it well, and it is. It's it's in such a sad state right now. I really need to take it to a luthier and, and get it all fixed up again. But um, it has for me the perfect tone. Like I remember in my twenties exploring uh, different acoustic tones, and I remember not liking Martins because they were so bright. Like they were just distinctly bright. And Taylor's for me felt warm. I loved the Taylor sound, but they were too warm for me. And I just like, I just want something with clarity and warmth. And that is a La Rive guitar. Yeah, they're it's great. It's clarity. It just has crystal clear clarity. Just and even just the little textures from your fing- fingers on the strings. And then, but this warm low end that it, it's like a warm hug from Taylor Swift. You know? <laughs> I love that. Um, so that's those are my two favorites. Um, clearly, there's much better guitars out there, but they they have <laughs> sentimental value and they have a, like a tone that I don't know just sits right with me. Right on. I was just kind of curious what you were rocking, what you really dug. How about you? I I imagine you have you must have a large collection. What what are some what are some of your favorites? Um, like ones a, that that if it disappeared, you would you would probably suffer a cardiac arrest. <laughs> I have a 1956 Gold Top Les Paul. That's wow. amazing. I have a 56 Les Paul Junior, both from the same year. That's amazing. Um, this I can show you this one. This is one of my favorites. This is a '64. Any, I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have um, not done cocaine, so I've kept most of my gear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I got a bunch of great guitar, a bunch of old vintage guitars that um, I use. A bunch of different stuff. Uh, one last thing before before I just uh, if you ever do circle back and listen to to my record, there um there's a song called Sidra on Volume One. Uh huh. And what it is is I had a girl come over and sing a two bar. She hummed a two bar phrase of every note in the D major scale. So she went hmm. Like what it's and she uh-huh. did the whole scale. That I elongated them, cut and pasted and elongated them to seven minutes, and then played um all the different notes, like played the faders and pro tools as as a synth. And, uh, and so it's it's she uh, they're all doubled. So there's like twenty some voices on that. And there's one guitar, and the one guitar is my old Les Paul through my Echoplex, my tape delay, set where the erase head doesn't engage. So it just keeps looping. It's this constant loop. So you'll hear, when I first play like the guitar, you'll hear that echo three minutes later in the song. So the whole performance is her singing the D major scale and me playing one guitar. God, that's so cool. 
I love this stuff when people do this. I love all the little details. And the funny thing is, is most people, they're just like, that's a really cool sound. What is that? The minute that I tell them it's somebody humming, they can't, they can't not hear yeah. it. So hopefully it elevates the song for you and doesn't ruin it. For oh, you, but no, that's check it out, man. I live for this stuff, man. I, I'm new to the world of tape loops. And like I, when I was talking with um, Sonora and his approach to tape loops, it just, it just had me fascinated. I was riveted and I love the ephemeral quality of it that even if you were to take that same tape loop and play live, you know, after X number of performances, it's going to start to further degrade and carry yeah. on new character, you know, new character in all different spots. Yeah. God, that's, just, that's really cool. I am. That's the first thing I'm going to do once I save all my files. I'm going to go check that out. I love it. I'm a sucker for little details like that, for little things that people put into their production that that make it all the more interesting and a, a show of um, non-conventional approaches to music composition and production. And that's that's really cool. That's I'm glad you shared that. Uh, right on, man. Well, if um if you get a chance, go to like hit me up on Instagram. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna compile some of the charity stuff that I did, and I'll send it to you. Cool. That's and awesome. Listen, if, I mean, I really did enjoy the conversation. Stay in touch, and if you ever want to make some music together, I I think it might be really fun. Let's do that. Let's do that because I've got some interesting ideas that I'm gonna probably lit release as just public stems and just turn people loose and go hey here's something try it out use your sensibilities use your approach your uniqueness and make something cool out of it and i yeah let's do it let's do it brian cool. all right buddy have a great evening <laughs> thank you so much brian it was so wonderful talking to you and let's let's do it let's keep in touch all right man take care be good all right you too all right who's here who's still here <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, that was such a wonderful conversation. I've never had an episode, though, span over two hours. So instead of belaboring and stretching out this outro, I just want to say thank you to Brian Ficino for the amazing conversation, for your time, and for just this wonderful space that we've managed to create. Plus, I want to say thank you to Sherry Finzer of Heart Dance Records for the hookup in this relationship and for the, all the music that you keep sending our way. Thank you so very much. You can find music by Brian Ficino out at Bandcamp at brianficino.bandcamp.com. Brian is spelt with an I, and Ficino is spelt F-E-C-H-I-N-O.bandcamp.com. Thank you so much, my friends, for tuning in to Ambient Discourses, conversations with musicians and composers who create musical experiences and sonic landscapes. Until next time, keep creating.